Perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ail Savan. I'm the head of strategic platforms with CIBC, a major Canadian bank. Uh, but I am here independently. Uh, yeah, this is my weird idea of a vacation. Um, and uh, uh, Ismail was, was kind enough to, to give me the opportunity to speak anyway. But that means that I am not going to talk about the amazing pioneering work we're doing at CIBC with our award-winning uh, API platform called the API Foundation. Not going to talk about that. Uh, and another sort of ground rule, I'm not going to talk about Canada and, and open banking, okay? So, so don't ask. Uh, my bank and myself are involved in all those wonderful consortium discussions and everything, which means I can't talk about it. So, so I'm not going to talk about Canada and open banking, and I'm not going to talk about my employer. So what's this guy going to talk about? I'm going to talk about architecture. That's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. And uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about building the optimal architecture for open banking and touch on a lot of the same subjects that Jason was talking about as well. So, what the heck is happening to banks? Well, banks are evolving. They're uh, transforming very quickly into technology companies. You don't have to look very hard to see this happening. It's happening across the board. It's happening in payments and mortgages and in retail and in wealth. Uh, just about everywhere you look in banking, in finance, you see uh, non bank entities, technology entities, nibbling away at the bank's uh, uh, business. Uh, so what are banks to do? Well, they have to learn some new tricks, the kind of tricks that technology companies already know. They have to learn about things like agile and DevOps and public cloud and, of course, everybody's favorite, APIs. Ever heard of them? Anybody? No? So APIs, the rise of the API. Well, as everyone knows, APIs are the pipelines that power open banking. I don't want to patronize the folks in the audience, so I'm going to do this super quick. Uh, what is open banking? This is a source of much debate. Let me give you what I see as, a, as an architect as the simplest definition. And if you're in the same kind of debates uh, with incumbents that I am, they, they like to split these hairs. So I find this to be a very useful structure. Partner APIs when you're hooking into Visa so that you can issue a Visa card is not open banking. Those are partner APIs. So when you do a one-to-one -one agreement with some other company and hook into their API that we've been doing for 30 years plus, doesn't count. Not open banking, no matter what the incumbents tell you. Open APIs. So you're starting to get there. This means you have an API posted somewhere uh, on some publicly accessible site that somebody can go sight unseen and start to use and test in a sandbox and then sign up and use the production version better. But if it was written using your proprietary data structures, using proprietary protocols, stuff that your bank came up with, mm, you're kind of hard pressed to really call that open banking. Open banking happens when those APIs become standardized. Okay, so open banking happens when an ecosystem of players who are all participating uh, with each other, trying to offer financial services, are using a common set of APIs. Uh, that, to me, is open banking. Far left of the diagram, that's, that's really what I would consider closed, and there's a bit of a continuum as banks start to share more and more of their data, more and more of the capabilities, until you arrive at what we now know as open banking. The thing is, even with that definition, depending on who you speak to, open banking means different things to different people. So let's take a quick look at the global landscape. If you go to open banking shows like I do on vacation sometimes, uh, you'll see a chart like this that talks about where all the countries are and, and, and how they're doing. This one's a little dated. It's from A.T. Kearney uh, from, from about uh, almost a year ago now. Um, so there has been some movement. Like I said, don't ask about Canada. That's why the question marks. Um, but what you see here is, is two important axes, a market axis and a regulatory axis. And the way A.T. Kearney discusses these is the, the market is a pull where effectively you're being pulled into open banking uh, by market forces, by competition, and a regulatory push where there is some sort of regulation that is compelling you to move towards open banking. You can see that there are some regions that are regulatory driven and some regions that are market driven. What's interesting, again, as an architect, you end up in sort of the same place. I'm not going to talk about the politics. I said I, that I wouldn't. Uh, but from a technical standpoint, you still end up with a consistent set of standards that everybody's going to share. You still end up with this notion of a registry, and you still end up with some kind of a, a model for governing participants in the ecosystem. It doesn't matter 
whether you're regulatory driven or market driven, open banking is open banking. It's trying to achieve the same goals. Uh, so, if I'm not going to talk about this stuff, the politics, and I promised I was going to talk about architecture, how do these two different approaches to open banking influence the architecture? So, it's very interesting because no open banking standard that I am aware of anywhere in the world talks about what to do with your stack. So all the standards will talk about APIs. They'll talk about these are the APIs you need to publish and, and this is what they should do and they should broadly cover payments and they should cover accounts and customer information and, and so on and they, they differ slightly and they certainly differ in their data representations. Uh, but none of them say anything about microservices or CICD or public cloud support or even particular security protocols and so on. So what that means is in regulatory driven environments, you effectively have a forced march to get the APIs right. You have a deadline, some regulator is yelling at you, they've set out the broad guidelines, and if you're in a, a large company, you have limited IT resources, you don't have all the, IT, all the money in the world, you're, you're gonna have to figure out how to spend your money. And if a regulator is telling you you have a deadline, well, you're gonna take those limited resources and work on the front. You're gonna get the APIs right, you're gonna get the API management right, uh, a lot of folks here and at other open banking shows will talk about things like API management. So that's what the banks in regulated regions did. They, they got really good at the API stuff. The thing is, they didn't have enough resources left to work on the bottom part of the stack. In all the regions where there isn't a regulatory driver and uh, you essentially have financial services companies going, hmm, I definitely have to compete with these technology folks, but I don't have a regulatory mandate to get the APIs right, what am I gonna work on? Well, the answer, in a word, is speed, right? What regions like Canada, regions like the US have been focused on is getting as good as technology companies at delivery, at what is commonly called CICD, continuous improvement, continuous delivery. Running an automated pipeline, having an architecture uh, that supports that automation, and trying to get your release frequency up to that Amazon, Google, Netflix, Uber kind of a level. That's what banks like mine have been working on, is getting faster. So, Whereas in the regulatory environment, you've got to focus on really developer experience, API management, uh, how's the portal, can developers come in and use it easily. In market-driven environments, we've been focusing a lot on isolation of business capabilities, which gets into things like domain-driven design and uh, vertical teams, two pizza teams. You get into objects and models, which gets into things like event sourcing and eventual consistency and dealing with distributed data. And of course, we have to deal with modern environments such as hybrid cloud, portability across cloud environments, uh, how to integrate legacy, ingress, egress po uh, points, et cetera. So there's a ton of stuff that we've been focusing on in the absence of regulation. The thing is, a complete open banking solution requires both of these things. You can't have just speed without proper API management, and you can't have proper API management without the CICD uh, plumbing to back it up. So how does this, uh, how do you do that, right? How do you start to develop an architecture that sort of brings these, these two worlds together? Well. That's where you get to this muddy term API gateway. Now, when I started down the journey of uh, modernizing our integration environment, uh, I started to, to read a lot of papers that called me a dinosaur because I still did SOA and SOAP and XML, and started to look into, okay, what's this cool new REST JSON way? This is a few years ago now. And uh, you quickly run into this term API gateway. But, oh, wow, it seemed impossible to pin down what exactly people meant when they said API Gateway. Surely Nginx was not the same as MuleSoft. They're radically different tool sets. So what the heck did people mean? And as you started to dissect the market, you start to realize what a lot of folks meant a couple of years ago, a lot has changed since then, was what I like to call the magic black box. And that means I'm gonna give you a hub, it's got all sorts of connectors and adapters and stuff, hook all your systems into my hub and it's just gonna automatically fix all your problems for you. Uh, I've been in this business for 25 years. I've seen this uh, strategy come and go by many different names. Before it was called uh, an API gateway, it was called uh, an ESB or an enterprise service bus. Before that, it was called uh, EAI. Before that, it was called ERP. And you can go back and back and back. 
the general idea is give me your spaghetti, put it in my giant spaghetti bowl, and uh, you'll be fine. In reality, what you end up with is just a, a bowl of spaghetti. It's, it's proprietary, it's impossible to maintain, it's a single point of failure, and it doesn't scale. So what do you do? Well, instead of concentrating all your traffic into this single master hub that doesn't scale and is a single point of failure, you distribute the stuff that that magic black box used to do into each individual microservice. Now, for those of you in the audience who are very familiar with microservices, I apologize, this is going to sound a little patronizing. Not my intention, bear with me, I'll get through it quickly. Uh, certainly the folks that I deal with sometimes do conflate APIs and microservices, which are not the same thing. APIs are the contract. APIs simply define what data comes in and what data goes out. They are independent of any implementation. Microservices are the implementation. So they're what you do when you take an API and you decide how to make it work. One of the architectural styles you can use is microservices, which effectively means, and I'm oversimplifying a little bit, that you're gonna give each uh, API its own container, its own little stack running independently, independently upgradable, independently scalable, and independently uh, deployable. Now, why would you wanna do this. Um, I, I love Jason's talk because he talked about the intentionality of adopting microservices. I wholeheartedly agree. Make sure you're doing it for a reason uh, and make sure if you're strangling out a monolith and you're moving to microservices that you're turning something off in the monolith. Uh, um, so definitely uh, use them with intentionality. But they're a very powerful tool and the best way to explain this, especially if you're working with legacy, is, is uh, by way of example. Let's say you've got a mainframe, uh, some 40-year-old piece of iron, and that mainframe uh, does 10 functions, and you decide, I'm going open banking, super modern APIs. Technically speaking, you could slap a gateway in front of that, or, or even some sort of adapter, that's going to expose the 10 functions that that mainframe executes as ultra-modern, super developer-friendly JSON REST APIs, GraphQL, gRPC, whatever you want. It doesn't really matter because the APIs are just the contract. So you could write these beautiful APIs that everybody loves, but your implementation underneath is still mainframe. You put these out into a marketplace, developers start to come to you, they start to ask for things. They say, hey, function number 10, can I add a field to that? I'd like to submit a, a change request to add a field, or a PR, I guess. Uh, or they say, hey, that ninth function, I, I'm gonna need to hit that 100 times more than I thought I was going to because of Black Friday or something. Well, guess what? If you're still sitting on your mainframe, you're stuck. They are gonna have to wait six months, a year, maybe never to get those changes done because you can't touch that code. It's sitting in a monolithic mainframe. Now, by contrast, if you take those 10 APIs and you implement them as 10 separate microservices, which to Jason's point, you wouldn't necessarily have to do, but bear with me, uh, you deploy them as 10 different microservices, suddenly, if that 10th one needs to be changed, you can change it without affecting the other nine. If the ninth one needs to scale, you can scale it without affecting the other nine. That's the power of microservices. You essentially get to break down your problem, and if you did your job, uh, in, in the words of uh, 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 Martin Fowler, you, you'd never have to replace your system again. You just have to upgrade pieces, right? So that this idea of I never have a monolith that I have to replace wholesale is a very attractive idea, uh, in particular in, in large enterprise environments. So we covered why microservices are better than traditional fat gateways, uh, but even the microservices landscape is evolving, right? We heard about serverless in the, in the previous presentation. Here it comes again. Um, so we started with these, these fat gateways, these fat monolithic gateways that were really focused on uh, API management and acting as that traffic cop and simplifying your life cycle and all that stuff. If anybody takes issue with where I put the names, stuff moves real fast in this uh, business, so, so don't, don't take it uh, too much to heart. Um, the monolithic applications you see on the left there were basically one large application, uh, often running in a J2E environment or something like that. Uh, that led to microservices because of all the benefits I mentioned previously, but uh, it was largely based on libraries. So the first shot at trying to standardize the kind of cross-cutting concerns that you get out of a gateway um, inside a distributed model, where, where I'm putting all that stuff inside each individual microservice, was library-based. So you saw things like Hystrix and Finagle, uh, Drop Wizard was quite popular in the Java community. But the idea was, I'm gonna compile a module or a library into my microservice 
that takes care of a bunch of stuff for me, security, circuit breaker, logging, et cetera. And this worked pretty well. Uh, certainly it was better than these big traffic cops, and that's why the, the mature tech companies would never touch that, that leftmost model with a 10-foot pole. They went to the library model and often developed their own libraries. But that started to lead to problems because that doesn't scale either. I don't want to have to recompile all my microservices every time I make a change to the library. I don't want to have to manage library versions. I don't want to rely on the discipline of my delivery teams to make sure that they're up to date. All of that is just a pain. And once you get to a certain level of scale, like in the diagram you saw in the previous uh, presentation, it just becomes unmanageable. Enter service mesh. So service mesh largely came out of solving that problem of library-based distributed gateways, where some smart folks from Google picked up uh, some material, the, the Envoy uh, uh, code base and, and some other stuff from the folks at Lyft, and they came up with something called Istio. Now, it's, it's worth mentioning that there were a number of other service mesh product uh, uh, options available at the time. There's Open Contrail, there's Linkerd, Kong, the, the CTO of Kong is a big advocate of service mesh. So I'm going to get into the details around service mesh uh, on the next slide, um, but the idea here was I'm going to leverage the fact that these are microservices to effectively pull the gateway out of each individual microservice and instead give each microservice a tiny little sidecar, a little proxy that sits alongside it and acts as a traffic cop just for that microservice. So this seemed to sort of be the best of both worlds. I have this centralized policy enforcement through these proxies, uh, but it's fully distributed, fully microservice-based architecture without any sort of traffic cops. Like I said, I'm going to get into more details on that later. It's worth mentioning serverless isn't the end of the story. There's, excuse me, service mesh isn't the end of the story. There's serverless uh, that's on the horizon along with a, a few other uh, technologies like no code, and I, I've heard Kelsey Hightower talk about that himself. Uh, he, he thinks it's pretty funny how far it's gone. Um, but for all the reasons that Jason mentioned, I don't think serverless is ready for prime time in the enterprise. Uh, there's a lot of risk of lock-in. A lot of the approaches are, are, are still being determined. Uh, it's, it's very volatile. So I would sort of leave it alone for now uh, for enterprise-scale applications, but certainly worth exploring for prototyping and, and to keep an eye on the future. Uh, so where do we go? From here, if we're not doing serverless and, uh, and, and microservice libraries are unmanageable, well, that brings us to the service mesh. Now, I call this presentation building the optimal architecture for open banking. I use that word quite intentionally, optimal. Uh, when I first wrote this deck, I, I thought of calling it the right architecture for open banking, but I didn't like that word because it's a moving target. Things are changing all the time. So the best thing I can tell you is what's optimal given the state of the industry today. That might change tomorrow. But today, the service mesh is the perfect option for open banking, okay? Why? Well, I get my microservice isolation, so I get my independent development teams, I get my polyglot, I get my, my isolated scaling, my isolated uh, 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 upgradability and deployment, all the benefits of microservices. But I don't have to embed a library into each of the microservices because I have this handy sidecar that's running along each one of them. Now these sidecars, they're automatically injected and deployed when you deploy your microservices to Kubernetes. So there's no work on behalf of the developers. This is if you're using Istio. There's an auto injection mechanism. You basically turn it on inside Kubernetes and every microservice that's deployed automatically gets a sidecar deployed alongside it. All of these sidecars are managed using a control plane. Uh, if you want to get nitpicky, the sidecars are technically called the data plane and in Istio they're made up of Envoy sidecars. Istio, strictly speaking, is just the control plane. This is exactly what it sounds like, a centralized interface for managing exactly what's going on on the proxies and deploying policy changes to them asynchronously. So you're not messing with the, uh, the traffic. You're not, you're not adding any sort of load. Um, it's worth noting the perimeter API gateway acts as an ingress-egress point between a trusted network and an untrusted network. That still stays, but the intention is that it's very lightweight. It's usually a combination of something like F5 and uh, Nginx or, or something equally lightweight like HAProxy. It's not intended to be a thick layer. It's essentially an SSL termination point. Finally, uh, all of your collections of microservices are divided into domains. You may be using a methodology like domain-driven design to decide how they're grouped together, um, but that grouping is going to drive some governance uh, decisions and, and how you're going to structure your teams around the collections of services. 
Um, I highly recommend domain-driven design. We found it to be a very useful tool for, for dealing with uh, the, the growing scale as you adopt microservices. Um, the term that you should keep in mind when you're thinking about service mesh is the distinction between north-south traffic, which is the stuff that goes up through the perimeter gateway, and east-west. When folks talk about why service mesh, they say because you should not be treating east-west traffic the same way you treat north-south traffic. If it's your internal applications talking to each other, then do not have them run through sort, some sort of traffic cop sitting on the edge of your network and then back down again. You're going to have a bad time. It's not going to scale. It's going to lead to all sorts of problems. So enter the service mesh, which effectively gives you uh, all of that control, but does it in a completely microservices native, uh, completely friendly way. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the precise control, an easy way to tie it into your API management. There are a number of API management tools which work nicely with service mesh tooling. Um, and you get your fully distributed cloud native microservices architecture. So where is this taking you if you've got this perfect, or excuse me, option, uh, optimal architecture for open banking? Well, we're headed to the bank of the future. So in order to actually execute on this strategy, I don't want you to think you do service mesh and you've got a silver bullet and all your problems are solved. Success in this space in building the bank, bank of the future is a balancing act. Okay? It's a technological and cultural balancing act. On the technology side, remember I said that uh, API regulation, open banking regulation, typically only addresses the API strategy and platform. It doesn't really deal with APIs, agile, DevOps, and cloud. The thing about these four pillars is you have to do them all at once. You have to recognize that they're interdependent because if you slack on any of them, it's going to drag back the other three. So very quickly, if you do all of them except for APIs, well, you're going to have this wonderful environment where you can deploy microservices, but you'll have terrible APIs that nobody wants to use because you didn't invest anything in API design or API management. So developers are going to write their own uh, using Atom, and they're going to be ugly. Uh, if you do all three except Agile, well, you're really good at de delivering uh, APIs and deploying them quickly, but you don't really have any way of capturing requirements in a meaningful way that a product owner could manage a backlog and actually deliver on business requirements because they're not talking the same language. If you do everything but DevOps, is that even worth mentioning? You'll just end up with constraints, right? So you'll end up with a bunch of code you can't deploy. And finally, if you do it all without cloud, you're going to hit a wall when you try to deploy these amazing new microservices to your legacy infrastructure. So you have to do all of these in lockstep. And you have to measure your success as you go across all four pillars and make sure there's no laggards. Even if you solve all of those problems, you've got the, the, the organizational structural challenges, so you have to look at Conway's law and figuring out how to reorganize your organization to fit these kind of microservices teams. And finally, you have to have strong leadership that is willing to invest in this change. Um, now, what is this change fundamentally? I'm going to talk about it a little from a technologist's perspective, but also from an open banking perspective. So from a technologist's perspective, there's an amazing thing going on. The metaphors for IT systems are changing. Uh, when I was cutting my teeth, the dominant metaphors for IT systems were fixed, hard things. Architecture meant architecture, like buildings, or city planning, or plumbing, or building bridges. And that was, comes from the premise that if you get the design wrong up front, the whole thing is going to collapse. You better nail the design, you better do all the math properly, and you don't start building the bridge until the blueprint is perfect. For a long time, that's how software was built. But that's changing. In light of all of these new technological advances, the metaphors are changing to things that look a lot more like biological systems, systems that are built to adapt and change and evolve. So suddenly, when you listen to microservices talks, you'll hear things about cells and membranes and uh, chromosomes and, and other biological things that come from biological systems thinking. To quote Martin Fowler, you know, the godfather of microservices, he says, there is no design at the beginning. You begin by coding a small amount of functionality, adding more functionality, and letting the design shift and shape. That goes to the heart of what creating applications using microservices is all about, creating systems that are built for change. So how does this relates to open banking. Well, open banking is all about innovation. 
and creating systems that are built to change, why are you doing that? You're doing that to enable the kind of innovation that open banking demands. Now, why is open banking demanding innovation? Because it's trying to change the nature of the relationship that customers have with their banks. Historically, let's face it, a lot of customers kind of hate their banks. Not my bank, all the customers of CIBC love their bank, but other banks, some people hate them. Why? Because their whole relationship with the bank is, is, is complex and uncertain and, and frustrating and filled with paper and manual processes and now I have to go to the branch. It's, it's, it's really not a pleasant experience and nobody really likes the bank in the first place. Well, open banking comes with a sort of implied promise. It's trying to turn the relationship into one based on simplicity, transparency, and delight. I sort of hate that word sometimes, but for open banking, it's true. We are trying to delight our customers. That's the promise. We even got the guy a, a, a girlfriend. Uh, so so uh, it really is about creating relationships with customers that are fundamentally authentic, right? Ann Bowden, the CEO of Starling, said it best. She said, innovation is all about addressing real issues that customers have and delivering something they really want. Not fees, not overdrafts, not frustration, but genuine advice, genuine help, uh, genuine uh, uh, warm, emotive feelings about their financial services providers. That's what uh, the challengers are, are trying to teach the incumbents, is that this is really about creating authentic customer relationships. And it is through those authentic customer relationships that we, the people in this room and similar rooms like it all over the world, uh, are going to create opportunities uh, that until today uh, you wouldn't have even been able to imagine. Thank you. Thank you, Ayal. Thank you very much. Question, questions? We have a bit of time for questions because unfortunately our next speaker didn't get his visa, so. Ah, oh, there. I was quite interested because I think your evolution and serverless versus service mesh and all that is all exactly the kinds of things that we're trying to grapple with. Um, but what I think I wanted to ask was, is there not still a need for, well, there's really two questions in my mind. Is there not still ne a need for an API gateway type there, which exposes kind of like a developer portal and your, your um, discoverability of, of APIs, which I don't know if that's the same as the perimeter API gateway in your thing. So the, the my second question. Sure, sorry, so <laughs> just excited to um, answer. Yep. It, the, the microservices, picture looked, looked great, but I'm also wanting to put alongside that some um, out-of-the-box platforms, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. which, so I don't have to build, I don't want to build the whole sort of banking platform yeah. myself, right? Uh, so absolutely. I need an architecture that kind of works with microservices and with yeah, yeah, a bit of monolith. Uh, absolutely. So, so uh, I'll take each of those in turn. So the first question was, do you need an API gateway to power a developer portal? The answer is a definitive no. There are a number of developer portal solutions that uh, just basically refer to your uh, service mesh control plane. They, they do not require to be tr uh, traffic interceptors. And the vast majority of the functionality that dev portals provide, I'm gonna be very careful here because there's a difference between a, an API lifecycle management tool and a dev portal. Dev portals mostly are managing uh, APIs. So APIs are just a contract. They're basically document repositories. There's no requirement for them to plug into any kind of runtime environment unless you're doing sandboxing. So you can just use something like uh, Rapid API or uh, what's another one, um, Modality or something. There's an open source project. They're effectively developer portals that are nothing but developer portals. They don't come with a gateway. They don't expect to intercept traffic. They just have an API-based mechanism to speak to your control plane. Um, so so there's, a, there's a number of options that are in lockstep with, with that development. Um, the second question was about legacy. This is really where Service Mesh shines, right? Uh, so how did we arrive at Service Mesh? Oh, I said I wouldn't talk about CIBC. How would one arrive at Service Mesh, right? You're using microservices. You're trying to build all of these cross-cutting concerns that are common to all of the microservices. But you start to hit legacy. You start to hit people who say, I'm not putting your module in my legacy code. I can't touch, 
I can't touch this code, it's COBOL code. It's been there for 30 years, uh, or this is a packaged application, I can't touch it, the source is closed. So you run into these very real scenarios where you, you simply don't have the option of embedding a fancy microservice module inside a legacy application. So what you end up doing is creating effectively a proxy that sits in front of that legacy application as a kind of adapter. That's basically what the service mesh is doing for you for free. Now you, you likely have to augment some of it by, by creating some sort of a logical abstraction, what's, what's sometimes called an isolation layer, but all of the nasty non-functional cross-cutting stuff, the service mesh effectively gives it to you for free and it does it in a way that doesn't touch your code at all. So, so when it comes to you have a bunch of systems that you're trying to get to talk to each other but you don't want to touch them, service mesh is perfect for that. Thank you, Al. Another question? Wave like your arm so I can see you if you... Do, do, do. One more? No? All right, Al, thanks so much. Thank you. Round of applause. <laughs>